In this video, which I'm calling 10.8 S1 or Supplement 1, we're going to learn about something that is related to graph coloring, um, but is not in your textbook. So I've labeled it graphs and groups because it has a little bit to do with group theory. Now we're going to learn as little about group theory as possible, just enough to help you to understand exactly how Burnside's Lemma works. So in our last video, we were looking at graph coloring and we were finding the chromatic number. So to be clear, this is a different kind of coloring, which means we are not finding the chromatic number. When we find the chromatic number, we have the restriction in place that vertices that are adjacent must be different colors. That's not what we're going to do now. So I'm taking away that restriction and I'm saying, if that's not a restriction anymore, how many ways can I color the vertices of say a square? So I have a square here and I have tokens that are labeled. So A is on the first vertice or vertex, B, C, and D. How many ways, if I can use yellow or blue, can I color the vertices of this square? Well, this one's pretty straightforward. A can be one of two colors. It can be yellow or it can be blue. B could be yellow or it could be blue. C could be yellow or blue. D could be yellow or blue. So by multiplying those out, I get that the number, so we're gonna use S to denote the number of ways. I'm sorry, we're going to denote S the ways that we could color it. And the cardinality of S would be the number of ways. So we said that's two, four times, or 16 different ways. Let's look at that same question again, but now my tokens or my vertices are no longer labeled. How is that going to change things? I want to know the number of distinct configurations that I have, keeping in mind that if a configuration can be found by either rotating or reflecting another configuration, then it's not considered distinct. So the question is, how many distinct configurations do I have? Well, if you'll notice, I've drawn out all 16 of the solutions from our last question where we did care about A, B, C, and D. So here's those 16. My question is, how many of these are distinct if I now don't have A, B, C, D on there? Well, obviously this is distinct because it's all yellow and I can't get another all yellow because you can see from the pictures, none of the other configurations are all yellow. So here's one. Now let's look at the next one. So on the next one, I have one blue vertex and three yellow vertices. But if you'll notice, I have that four times. All four of these are the same because if I took, say, this guy and I rotated him 90 degrees clockwise, I would get the next configuration. And then if I took that configuration and rotated it again, 90 degrees clockwise, keeping in mind that would be this uh, first vertex to the second, second to the third, third to the fourth, and so on, that would be a rotation to another same configuration or non-distinct. So these four would be considered another configuration. So instead of this being four configurations, this is my second configuration. So, so far I have two distinct configurations. The next configuration gives me two blue and two yellow, but again, you'll notice that all three of these along with this guy down here. So I have two blue, two yellow, two blue, two yellow in that order, two blue, two yellow, two blue, two yellow. That means these four, let me try to circle them all together. That's another group of a one distinct configuration. So all four of those have now become one distinct configuration where I have two blue and then two yellow. The next distinct configuration is also two blue, two yellow, but as you can see, it's not the same. I've got yellow and blue, um, basically blues across from each other and yellows across from each other. So these two are the same configuration. They are the fourth configuration. 
Then I look at three blue and one yellow, and there are four of those, again, just like there were four of my second configuration. Oops, and that's the fifth way. And of course, all blue is another distinct configuration. So the question, how many distinct configurations do I have? I have six distinct configurations. What we really want to do is not have to draw out all 16 configurations and then determine which ones are similar or the same or undistinct. So before we can use Burnside's lemma to tell us that, we need to know a little bit about groups and about the 3D motion of a square. So we're not going to get crazy into group theory. I'm really only going to touch um, on whatever topics we need to in order to understand Burnside. So I do want to talk about the group of rotations and reflections of, in this case, a square. So when we talk about rotations and reflections of motion, we're saying that the footprint of this square has to stay the footprint of the square. So what rotations or reflections will keep the footprint of the square exactly where it is? For instance, if I were to reflect the shape over, let's just pretend that's directly in the middle, we can see that what would happen is these two vertices would switch sides and these two vertices would switch sides and that it would still look like the exact same square. However, if I drew some cattywampus crazy line like this, and then I reflected it over that line, that's not going to work because this part would, I can't even draw it because I'm not that gifted, but you get the idea that it wouldn't be a square when we reflected it. So it would be a square, it just wouldn't be in the same place. So what we're looking for is what kind of rotations and reflections keep the base or the footprint of that square in the same place. So if I'm talking about a rotation, I have a rotation of not doing anything, zero degrees. We're going to call that pi sub zero. I have a rotation of, again, 45 degrees would give me something that looks like this, which is a square but not my original square. So 45 is not considered a valid rotation. However, I could rotate it 90 degrees as we were just talking about. That would take the first vertex to the second, the second to the third, the third to the fourth, the fourth to the first. That's a 90 degree rotation. So you might see that written pi 90 or you might see it written just pi one because it's the first one. And then if I look at the next valid rotation, it would be 180 degrees. So I'm just going to call that pi two. And then the next one would be 270 degrees. And again, 180 would be basically moving two positions. And then 270 would be moving each one three positions. One, two, three. So we get the idea and we're gonna call that pi three. And then if I did 360 degrees, hopefully we understand that that's really the same thing as not doing anything. So now let's talk about reflections. For a reflection, I could have a horizontal reflection. You might see it called H. You might see it called R1. I could have a vertical reflection, which is may be called V or maybe called R2. You could have a reflection across the first diagonal, which is D1, or you might see it called R3. And the second diagonal, which is D2, or sometimes D prime, and we're going to call it R4. So when we're talking about our group, our group is the set of all of those. So our group is pi zero, pi one, pi two, pi three, r one, r two, r three, and r four. Now, what makes it a group? Well, there are a lot of different properties that go along with groups, but again, 
that's not going to be important to us now. Our, the important thing is that we understand how to find those rotations and reflections. Now, before we move on, I do want to talk about um, questions that will involve two-dimensional space versus three-dimensional space. When they're talking about two-dimensional space, they're talking about rotations only. Because if you can think about two-dimensional space, think about that the square must remain flat on the surface. So I can rotate it and that square will remain flat on the surface. But if I'm talking about three-dimensional space, then it's going to include both rotations and reflections. Because for a reflection, I would sort of have to like pick this vertex up and fold it over, which means it would come off the table for a minute. And that is why it would be considered three-dimensional space instead of two-dimensional space. Now that we have a little more information about the symmetry group of a square, let's take a look at which of those elements of G would give us a stabilizer for each of our configurations. And when I say stabilizer, I mean that by performing that rotation or reflection, my object would look exactly the same, meaning the same colors in the same places. So if you'll recall, this was its own little group. Now, if I look at rotating that zero degrees, would I still end up with all the yellows where they are now? Yes. What about rotating at 90 degrees? Would yellow end up with yellow? Yep, because they're all yellow. What about 180 degrees? Yep, all the yellows would still match up with other yellows. What about 270? Yep, because all of the vertices are yellow, it doesn't matter how I rotate it. The same is going to go with reflection. Can I give a horizontal reflection? Yes, yellow is going to go to yellows. Vertical, yes. Diagonal, yes. Diagonal, yes. I did those diagonals in the wrong order, but you get the idea. Which means how many of the elements of G are stabilizers? Eight of them. Do I have to list them? No. I don't care what they are. I care how many there are. So we're going to call this one, two, three, four. Remember there were 16. So let's look at number two then. If I look at two, again, let's start at the beginning of the list, which is pi zero, which means we're looking at not rotating at all. So uh, spoiler alert, if I don't rotate anything at all, that's going to be a stabilizer for everything because it makes perfect sense that if I don't do anything, blue's gonna stay with blues, yellow's gonna stay with yellow. So that's always gonna be a stabilizer. What about if I rotate 90 degrees? Well, 90 degrees would take this blue to this yellow. And that's not okay because the stabilizer says the coloring is gonna be exactly the same. So pi one, not a stabilizer. What about pi two? That's 180 degrees. Nope, blue goes to yellow, not gonna work. What about pi three? Nope, blue goes to yellow, not gonna work. All right, let's look instead at reflections. R1, we said, and again, we don't care what they are, we just care how many there are. So I believe we said R1 before was going to be the horizontal. Um, would that work? Nope, blue goes to yellow. What about a vertical? Whoops, <laughs> maybe try to put it in the middle of your figure. Would that work? Nope, because blue goes to yellow. What about our first diagonal? Yes, that works because blue is going to stay where it is that yellow will stay there where it is. The only thing that's gonna flip-flop is those two corners. So we can call R3 a stabilizer, but R4, again, would not be because if I tried to reflect across the other diagonal, blue would go to yellow. Now, the good news is we already said that two through five were the same um, configuration just rotated. So we just found that this was two stabilizers, which means all of these are the same. They might not be the same stabilizers, but it doesn't matter. We're looking for the number. Same thing's gonna happen for six, seven, eight, and nine. Remember, those were all the same. So let's look at it for six, and then just say that it's the same for the rest. So for six, obviously we already said the rotation of zero is going to be a stabilizer. It makes perfect sense that none of the other rotations are going to work because 90 would take blue to yellow, 180 would take blue to yellow, 
um, 270 would take blue to yellow. So we get the idea that's not going to work. The first um, reflection, could I do this? No, blue goes to yellow. But I could do a reflection across the vertical axis because blue would go to blue, yellow to yellow. So it's the same coloring. So that one works. What about diagonals? Nope, blue and yellow would switch places, blue and yellow would switch places. So we just get two. So if I get two there, then I get two for each of these. So we're off to a great start. Um, again, that should have been all circled together. Our next group was 10 and 11. We said these two were the same, but different. Remember, they were not distinct. They were um, could be reached by rotating. If I look at the stabilizers for either of the elements in that little group, I could do nothing. I couldn't do 90 degrees, but look, I could do 180. So I can do 180 because yellow would go to yellow and blue to blue, but I couldn't do 270. And then could I reflect across the horizontal? Nope, that's not going to work. What about vertical? No, that's not going to work. Again, blue goes to yellow. Could I do a diagonal? Yes. Could I do the other diagonal? Yes. So I've got two rotations and two reflections, so that gives me four stabilizers and four for 11 as well. If I look at the next group, 12, 13, 14, 15, hopefully you can see that that's exactly like my second group here. Remember here I had one blue, three yellows. So in this group I have one yellow, three blues. So it makes perfect sense that it's going to still be twos. And hopefully you can see that 16 and one are essentially the same. One has all yellow, one has all blue. So this is going to be eight. Now on to Burnside, which sometimes is called not Burnside or anyone other than Burnside's Lemma, simply because Burnside was not the one who came up with it. He just actually compiled some information. Um, Burnside's Lemma says that if we let S be the set of configurations, so that's that 16 different configurations that we've been looking at, and we let G be the group of symmetries, so remember that was the pi 0, pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, R1, R2, R3, R4, the number of symmetries, then we can find the number of equivalence classes or orbits, or in this case, colorings, by using this function. So it's one divided by the number of items or elements in the group of symmetries. And then we're taking the sum of essentially all of the stabilizers. So we just worked on finding those stabilizers for each element of S. So again, it's not important that you know what an orbit is or what a stabilizer is or what an equivalence class is. But what is important to know is the system that we just went through where we said, okay, the first one was eight. There were four elements in the second set and each of those had two stabilizers. There were four in the next set and each had two stabilizers. There were two in the next set, each had four stabilizers. There were four elements, again, of S in the next set, each had two stabilizers, and then there was that last um, configuration that had eight stabilizers. And if I take the sum of all of those and I divide it by the number of elements in the group of symmetries, so one divided by eight of that sum, I'm going to get the number of different colorings or number of equivalence classes. And again, it doesn't matter that it's called an equivalence class or an orbit or anything like that. What it matters is it gives us the answer that we are looking for. So again, there's a lot of group theory and, and other things behind all of this, but you don't need to understand that to appreciate the uh, Burnside's Lemma. I want to look at that exact same question just one other way. And when I use Burnside, this is the way that I think about it. So when we are looking at the rotations and reflections of a square, what I'm thinking about with two colors, and again, we're using just M is two or the number of colors is two. I'm saying this vertex, how many colors could it be? It could be two different colors. And that's if I'm going zero degrees, it can be two colors. Well, this one could also be two colors because I'm not moving it. So I don't have to worry about anything matching up when I'm rotating. 
So all of these could be two colors. So all four vertices could be two colors. So two to the fourth. If I rotate 90 degrees, my first vertex could be two colors, but my second vertex has to be whatever I've chosen for the first vertex. And because this one's going to rotate to the bottom right, that has to be the same color. And if I rotate that around, this has to be the same color. So whatever I've chosen for my first one, black or white or blue or yellow or whatever the two colors I'm using, I can choose whatever I want for one vertex, but the rest of them have to be whatever I've chosen for the first. So that's just two to the first. Um, 270 is going to be the exact same thing. And then we'll come back to 180 in just a second. So whatever I've chosen here is going to come over to this vertex and that's going to go to this vertex and that's going to go to this vertex. And so you can see that I have one vertex that I can choose and the rest of them are dependent on that first one. Now 180, just a little bit different because I can choose anything I want here and it's going to rotate to the opposite side of the square. So just one, but I can also choose anything I want here because it's going to rotate to the opposite side over here. So I have two vertices that I'm free to choose um, and the other two are based on whatever I've chosen for the first two. Same thing with horizontal vertical. Again, if I have a horizontal line, I can choose anything I want for the top two, but the bottom two vertices will have to be whatever I've chosen for the top two. So two squared, and that's going to be the same for vertical. I can choose whatever I want on the left, but the right hand side is going to have to be the same. So two squared. And then for diagonals, those are a little bit silly because I can choose whatever I want on the two parts of the diagonal and whatever I want for one of the two vertices, but the remaining vertice is going to be the same. And those two are going to be uh, essentially the same pattern. I know this video is getting a little lengthy and I apologize, but I wanted to make sure I explained everything in enough detail for it to make sense. So let's look at a practice together. This is an equilateral triangle. And this one is talking about four different colors and it's free to rotate. So free to rotate essentially means that we're looking only at two space. We're looking only at rotations. Um, and so G would be any rotations of our triangle. So obviously I could have pi zero, which would be that I'm not rotating it at all. In order for my triangle to end up still looking like a triangle exactly where it is, I would have to take 360 divided by three, since there are three um, vertices, three sides, to get 120 to know that I'm going to then rotate 120 degrees and 240 degrees. And if I do 360, I'm back where I started. Now, just as I did before, I can say that's pi one and pi two. That notation really doesn't matter as much as you understanding essentially how to use it. So now what? That means the cardinality of G is three. So when I'm finding my solution, it's going to be one divided by three. And now I have to look at each element, uh, I'm sorry, each element of G and say, what? how many stabilizers are there? So if I look at four colors, We'll just go straight with the four colors. If I rotate zero degrees, my first element could be any one of four colors. And since I'm not rotating, the second element could be any one of four colors and the third element could be any one of four colors. So that's four to the third. If I were to rotate to, uh, sorry, 120 degrees, my first um, vertex could be any one of four colors but because my first vertex is going to rotate to my second vertex, my second vertex can only be whatever color I have chosen for the first vertex. And my third vertex can only be what other color I have chosen for the second vertex. So essentially it's four to the first. And I'm sure you can understand it's going to be the exact same thing for pi two because I can choose any color for my first vertex but since it's rotating around to my third vertex, this color needs to be whatever I choose. And since this one is rotating up here, this guy needs to be whatever color I originally chose. So plus four. 
So I have a third of 64 plus 4 plus 4, or a third of 72, or we have 24 different configurations. Here is a similar question that I'd like you to try on your own. So see how far you can get into this one. When you're ready, press play to see how you did. So for this one, I've changed two things. Instead of four colors, I now have N colors. And instead of two space, I'm looking at three space. So before, when I looked at G, I said I could rotate it not at all, or 120 degrees, or 240 degrees. But now I'm going to include the reflections. So we'll just call this R1. I'm sorry, maybe say and write the same thing. So R1, this is R2, and this is R3. And again, it doesn't matter which is which, it just matters that there are three of them and there are the three reflections, R2, R3. So that means in this case, the cardinality of G is six instead of three. So I'm going to have one sixth. Now, if you'll recall on our last question, our solution was one third, and then we said four to the third plus four plus four. So those were four to the first. So I'm going to use that and say, okay, I've already done all of the work there. This is going to be, instead of four to the third, this is going to be N to the third instead of four it's n and instead of four it's n so i've just done all three rotations because i already did the work on the last question so now let's look at the reflections so for the first reflection r1 this first vertex can be whatever color i want it to be out of the end so i have n different choices for the first vertex for my second vertex it can also be anything because the first one is staying where it is. The second one is going to reflect across R1. So this can be whatever color I want it to be, but my last vertex has only one choice and it's whatever I, I chose for N. So that would be N squared. Now, because it's a reflection and you can see that the reflections are the same, looking at R2, my first vertex could be N choices this vertex could be n choices but this vertex down here would be whatever i chose for this vertex so that's n squared and then of course the same thing for the last one n squared so what's my solution my solution is one sixth and then i'm just going to do the algebra here this is n cubed and i had three n squareds and i had two n's now, if I then said, okay, find it for five colors, you would simply replace N with five, but in this case, we're just leaving it general for how many if there are N colors, and that's my solution.